The Jeep used to be king of the mountain, but can the new guy get back on top? We'll find out this week on Motoring 99. TSN's Motoring 99 is brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oils, formulated for the vehicles you drive and the way you drive them. And Midas Car Care, the way it should be. Hello everybody, welcome to Motoring 99. I'll tell you about these helicopters in a moment, but first, you know in this program we're always listening to car manufacturers tell us about their cars, and always they're saying, we listen to the consumer, we want your input so we can build better cars. But when it comes to sport utilities, I don't get it. I mean, manufacturers will admit only this many ever go off-road, yet they spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on off-road technology. So the question is, are consumers wasting their money on technology they're never going to use? We're going to hop on board one of these helicopters, head into the Rocky Mountains here in Alberta, see if we can find an answer to that question, but also to introduce you to the brand new Jeep. This week on Test Drive, we're in the Rockies and we're here to put this vehicle through its paces. This is the 1993 Jeep Grand Cherokee. Now, as you'll see, the differences with this vehicle are more than just skin deep. It was back in 1992 when the all new Jeep Grand Cherokee made its debut in North America and on motoring. The vehicle was an instant hit and was number one in the sport ute market for years. But recently, it lost the number one spot to the Ford Explorer. Chrysler has responded with this all-new model for 1999. Based on the new WJ platform, Chrysler spent $2.6 billion on the new Jeep, and that price includes $800 million on an all-new 4.7-liter V8 and a new automatic transmission. Now, the limited model features a 5.9-liter V8 that punches out 245 horsepower tops in its class should also make it a big favorite at the local gas bar. Not that anybody spending $50,000 really cares about fuel economy. I think they really care about fuel economy. Uh, through our marketing research, we found that a couple of our competitors, and I really don't want to name them right now, uh, their customers are getting a little fed up of going to the gas station about twice a week now to fill up. So with our improved 4.7, all new, I should say, 4.7 liter V8, and a fuel economy of 24 miles to the gallon on the highway. And uh, I can't remember, I think that's around 11 liters per 100 kilometers. Um, I think our customers are gonna take a serious look at our product because of the fuel economy. The styling is not exactly revolutionary, but the biggest improvement is the removal of the spare tire from the cargo area, which used to take up about 30% of the room. A four-speed automatic is the only transmission available, along with a choice of two transfer cases. A full-time select track system is available on the six-cylinder model, and a quadra-track four-wheel drive option with the other power plants. Select track system is the standard system, and uh, it is conventional. It's the same kind of four-wheel drive system as used in previous generations of vehicles. The new quadra drive system will deliver torque to all four wheels all the time. It's a brand new system unlike anything else in the marketplace. Go anywhere, anytime, any place. Since most drivers very seldom go off road, the Quadra track could simply be a waste of your money. But a lot of people, and especially a lot of women, uh, like the on-demand systems, our new Quadra track too, because you don't have to put the vehicle into that system, actually engage it. It's on demand, it's always thinking, it knows when to go into four-wheel drive mode. And it'll go into four-wheel drive mode as you're cruising along on a highway, you've hit a lot of sand, a lot of debris on the road, and again, very few uh, SUV buyers go off-roading. When you're looking at MSRP of $46,000 for one with major equipment, 
that's a lot of money, mind you. Uh, as we had explained to us earlier, that's the mid-upper level. We have the luxury sport ute group that pay sixty-five and seventy thousand dollars a unit. And interestingly enough, in the U.S. alone, that segment grew by two hundred and nineteen percent in 1998. People lost their minds. No, I think they're having fun. We went through ten years in this land when you really couldn't afford anything because money was tight, interest rates were high, and it was tough to get what you really wanted. We've had some hard-working people here. They've made some money. Uh, in the last couple of years, the stock market's been a great place to make some money. Now they're going to spend some money, and they're having some fun. We have a lot more players coming up, uh, like uh, we did last night in some of our presentations to the Canadian journalists here. We went to about the year 2001, if I remember correctly, and showed that there's a lot of competitive products coming in, all new products, and that's why we're continuing to enhance our product even further. Jeep parking only. All others will be towed, like anybody else could get up here. We're four-wheeling later on Kenzie's Corner. The new Jetta comes with three basic engines. A two-liter gasoline-powered four that's a complete not a waste of time, a 1.9-liter turbocharged diesel that's good for 64 miles per gallon on the highway, and this, the VR6. Whilst the Jetta's always been an eminently drivable car, for me it's always been the epitome of boredom. Well, Volkswagen are out to change that perception as they launch the fourth generation car, a car that's based on the same platform as the Beetle. The Jetta's lines are clean and tight, giving a reassuring look of sturdiness. In addition, the larger rims and lower profile 19565 tyres seem to fill the wheel wells, delivering an impression of strength. Up front, the Jetta's headlights use free-form reflectors and are covered with a clear lens that generates a look of quality. They're also more functional, delivering better light and a safer drive at night. The 2.8-litre narrow-angle V6 is good for 174 horses and an awful lot of fun. A variable intake manifold extends the engine's practical range down to as low as 1,000 RPM. It also delivers wonderful response at the high end of the rev range. Even when driving at 100 km an hour in fifth gear, the engine scoots if you need to pass a slower moving vehicle. Flexible only begins to describe how sweet the VR6 is and how it enables the driver to appreciate the rest of the dynamic qualities. The manual gearbox, while delivering a good set of ratios, is still rather rubbery to the feel. The clutch, however, is nicely weighted and progressive. The suspension is fully independent, featuring McPherson struts and a roll bar up front, and a torsion beam axle with coil springs and another roll bar in the rear. The new design separates the coil springs from the dampers, allowing the suspension engineers more leeway in the calibration process. The result is a more consistent feel, sportier handling, and a better absorption rate of the roughness that defines the roads in Canada. For the record, we required 114 feet to stop from 80k. A new four-wheel disc brake system that includes anti-lock is now standard. During the brake test, the large disc did a great job of resisting fade and delivering straight and fast stops. That the ABS does not intervene too early and the pedal offers a crisp, easily modulated feel is an advantage. Volkswagen have stretched the Jetta's wheelbase by 38 millimeters, which means that you've now got a total of 105 centimeters worth of legroom. That's about an inch more than the previous model. That said, you still know you're riding in the back of a compact car. As far as safety is concerned back here, well, it's top notch. Three point belts and headrests in all three positions. Up front, you've got a full set of analog gauges with all of the warning lights grouped in the middle. The power options sit on the door, and below them, the remote fuel filler and trunk release are lockable. On the right side, climate controls that can be operated with gloved hands. However, the radio, you cannot. The buttons are still too fiddly. The other thing I like, setting the perfect driving position is a piece of cake. You've got tilt and telescopic steering, plus this pump action lever that lets you put the chair in the perfect place. There's also 
the largest dead pedal in the industry. The trunk delivers plenty of usable space, usable because the special cantilever hinges employed on the deck lid do not intrude into the trunk. Standard safety items include dual front airbags and side seat mounted airbags. Placing them in the seat as opposed to the door ensures that they stay in the right place when you move the seats. The new Jetta with the VR6 engine is a very competent automobile. Good enough in fact that it's going to give some of its more expensive competition a real run for their money, including the Passat. Our Midas tip of the week concerns joining an auto club or motor league. In many cases when I look around our parking lot I'll find that 30% of the vehicles that got here got here via the tow truck and in some cases it was quite an expensive tow bill. If you're a member of an auto league or motor club in many cases some or all of the towing would be covered by your membership. They have a host of other services as well including trip mapping, lockout service if you lock your keys in the car, they'll bring gas out to you if you're stalled on the road, boost your car, install the spare tire if you have a flat, etc. Many of these are quite valuable services and in most cases they're covered by your membership. Now if your car is quite new and it's under warranty you may also have roadside assistance so you may not require a separate membership in a motor league. But if your car is out of warranty this is a darn good thing to think about. Might be a good thing for you to purchase for yourself or even a good gift item for that hard to buy person. That's your Midas tip of the week. Motoring dropped in on a group of burning rubber aficionados celebrating the automobile on a Sunday afternoon. It was the Muscle Car Nationals held at the London Motorsport Park in St. Thomas, Ontario. Well, what we tried to do was uh, stick with the roots of the muscle cars. They were built by the factories to be race cars, um, quasi-legal race cars on the street. Um, everybody knew it and we just wanted the opportunity for the guys to have these restored cars to be able to run them on the track like they, they were meant to be. A uh, muscle car is a car that's probably got too large an engine for the body <laughs> and uh, they were street legal race cars almost. Um, generally production figures were quite low on the cars and the value, or what makes this meat special is the value of the cars you'd think it wouldn't justify racing them. But they're racing them, the, the, the values are there, and yet they're still racing them. Like they're, running, they're running the risk of wrecking a real expensive car, but everybody just has fun with it. Uh, your average car is probably around $20,000, up, up to about uh, 100000 for some of the cars. So I don't understand this. So we got big time uh, drag racing here. You're sitting here in a cigar. Uh, what, what, what's going on? Hey, you got to have your toys. You know, come down. Uh, I've got a whole bunch of race cars that I sponsor, and I got to have a toy myself. You know. What are you driving? Uh, it's a 1992 Lincoln LSC. Is that what's nice about these uh, these drag races going out in the country like this one? That anybody can hop in their car and just see how fast they can get it going. That's the magic of drag racing. Anybody can bring their car in off the street and go out and have fun and they set their own time, they dial their own handicap, they're racing against themselves basically. You don't have to worry about the guy in blue either. No, the guy in blue, he doesn't worry about this stuff. He just waits for you out on the street when you leave. You know, today's modern vehicles can certainly spoil us consumers with all sorts of creature comforts. I mean, take the remote. It's been around for many years, but recently they have added a panic safety button to it, and they've also brought in the lights and the horn to indicate when your car is locked. And let's face it, that horn can be handy when you can't find the car in the parking lot. But let's say you're coming home, it's one or two in the morning, you've had a hard day at the office, and you go to lock your vehicle. That can be very irritating, especially to your sleeping neighbors. So what if Chrysler are done? Well, in this new Jeep, you can program the vehicle to fit your own needs, and that includes turning off the horn. Now, with the exception of the top-of-the-line Limited, it is an option, but hey, ain't it worth it? 
to have happy neighbors. And incidentally, I have found a pet peeve with this new Jeep. I'll tell you about that later on. But first, let's head to the garage and join Bill Geidner. What I want to talk about this week is a dilemma that I'm sure many of you have faced. You take your car or light truck in for a wheel alignment and moments later you're confronted by the mechanic coming out to the reception area and telling you that you need several hundred dollars worth of front end repairs, parts that need to be replaced before they can accurately do that wheel alignment. In many cases that's true. We find a lot of vehicles coming in with bent, broken or misaligned parts that need to be replaced before an alignment can properly be done. One thing I should mention here is that uh, the, the methods of testing a lot of these components have changed somewhat over the years. And the days of getting a great big huge pry bar and reefing on everything in many cases are gone because a lot of these vehicles, the components are so light duty in the front end that you can deflect them or unload them off their seat somewhat with a big enough pry bar. So it's not an accurate way of testing them. So uh, guys, we've got to catch up on uh, accurate ways of testing. Anyhow, what I want to talk about this week is uh, the idler arms on this GM minivan. It's an Astro Safari rear-wheel drive minivan. They had a real problem with idler arms wearing out prematurely. What's the job of the idler arm, or in this case, idler arms? It's to position this steering linkage, everything that you see right here, in, hold it in position and keep it moving only in a horizontal plane. There should be a minimum amount of vertical movement to this linkage. And by the way, this is one of the only vehicles that I know of that has two idler arms. Now, when we start turning the steering to the right, you can see that linkage move across. It's nice and quiet and it moved only horizontally. But when I bring the linkage back, you can see that it jumped up vertically before it went to the left. Uh, to come back to the right, it jumps downward and then moves horizontally across to the right. What, ideally, we want that linkage to move only in a horizontal plane. All that vertical movement that we've got there translates into slop in the steering wheel. As you're going down the road trying to hold the wheel straight or make minor steering corrections, you've got to take out all of that slop before you move the wheels. So that makes for a numb or loose feel to the steering and translates into a lot of tire wear. Boy, I'm fast today. Okay, we'll pull the linkage down out of the way. There's the lash in that idler arm. That's the vertical play that shouldn't be there. It's only supposed to move like this horizontally, remember? Swing it out of the way, take our impact gun, and off she comes that quickly. There's been a huge improvement in these idler arms on the GM Astro and Safari minivan. This old used one that I'm taking out, the one that's worn out, is an aftermarket one. And you can see that the support comes into it but doesn't project through this side. There's the grease fitting. Now in the new one, this is a General Motors original one, and it's a newer design than what was on the van originally. They've brought the support arm right through to the other side, and there's this giant nut, so it's supported here and here. This one will stay tight for a long time, and it has a minimum amount of rotation torque, so it spins easy, and it's greasable at both ends, just like original. We found that these will outlast this design about two to one. Like I said, I'm fast. I've got the new idler arm on, and I use this tool right here to draw the steering linkage onto that tapered stud right there. I can't use the lock nut to pull it together or the stud would just spin. Now the lock nut goes on, being careful to keep the right side against the, uh, against the shoulder. And we can use the gun to spin the nut down until it just kisses the linkage and then we've got to final tighten it with the uh, torque wrench. And that's an important step, you've got to torque all these front end fasteners. Matter of fact, the two bolts that secure the idler arms to the frame are brand new ones that come with the idler arm kit and they're already Loctited. Now the next thing you would do, of course, is grease it. Now through the magic of TV, I've already replaced this other idler arm on the right side. And when I grab this steering linkage now and turn the steering linkage back and forth as I did before with those worn parts, now you can see that the linkage only moves in a horizontal plane. That's the way it should be and that's going to minimize all that play in the steering. We'll be able to accurately set the wheel alignment. And of course, that's the final step, resetting the front wheel alignment to make sure we have a minimum of tire wear. It's very important to uh, check your vehicle. If you've got a vehicle like this minivan that has many grease points, they have to be done on a regular basis. And more frequently, if you've just had sloppy, wet weather because all this grease gets washed out by that road splash. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 99. That guy way at the very top of that hill? Well, believe it or not, I just walked up there and back. I'm not sure my heart will ever recover. Now, you might well wonder why would I, me of all people, walk all the way to the top of a hill like that when I have access to this Jeep Grand Cherokee over here? I could have driven to the top of that hill, no problem. 
Well, Chrysler wants us to tread lightly. That means don't drive on fragile environments. Some of this tundra here, these plants would take hundreds of years to regenerate if we ripped them up with our tires. Which brings up a whole point about four-wheel drive that a lot of owners don't think about. Just because you can do something in one of these trucks doesn't necessarily mean that you should. I'm pretty sure your neighbor doesn't want you doing donuts in a rose garden either. But it even applies to on-road situations. I get complaints all the time from owners of passenger cars about four-wheel drives intimidating them on the highway. They're crowding them and they got the weight in the four-wheel drive in the high seating position. They really can be pretty irritating at times. So come on guys, give us the rest of us poor guys a break. And also don't forget what the pickup truck guys say about four-wheel drive. It just lets you get stuck deeper farther from home. Now in a passenger car like a Jeep, this translates into it lets you have your accident at a higher speed. We were driving on gravel roads earlier today, and in rear-wheel drive, the truck was all over the place. It would slide sideways. It was great fun to drive, but not very stable. When we pulled it back into four-wheel drive, it was just like the thing was on rails. It just tracked really well. However, at some point, you do have to steer, and you do have to brake. And if you're going too fast for conditions, well, you're going to have your crash at a higher speed. So don't forget, just because you can go fast in these things, doesn't mean that you should. Even though they've got a lot of capability, the responsibility is still with you. I'm Jim Kenzie. Well, all I can say is if Jim does plan on doing a little off-roading in the new Jeep, he doesn't sit in the back. Up front, plenty of headroom now, but back here, I'm almost touching, and I'm five, eight and a half on a good day. So what's the bottom line? Would I buy the new Jeep? No. And don't all you Jeep fans and Chrysler folks start getting your shorts in a knot. The reality is, I don't have the opportunity to live out in this beautiful countryside. I live in the city. And if I'm looking for space, I buy a minivan. If I'm worried about traction, I get all-wheel drive. I don't need the low gear to climb mountains with. But then again, what do I know? SUVs are hot. Car manufacturers are making a ton of money on them. And unless station wagons start making a comeback, they're going to sell a lot of these. That's it for now. We'll see you next week as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. Uh, there's about a billion liters of lubricating oil that's sold in Canada on an annual basis. So unfortunately, there's about 150 million liters that go unaccounted for. And to date, we're heading into the next millennium, and there still is no regulation in uh, Canada's largest province to deal with this issue. TSN's Motoring 99 has been brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oils, formulated for the vehicles you drive and the way you drive them. And Midas Car Care, the way it should be.